I think that's always been sort of a challenge for the Army of mm -hmm. uh, wanting to leverage technology, but then also being such a, the most people-centric of all mm -hmm. of the services, um, seeing that there might be some institutional threat to becoming overly reliant on that. And, and also, uh, just an, ex an expectation that if you are going to be, as you have talked about before, uh, delivering that effect in and amongst the people as, yeah. a, as, as a core competency, um, making sure that you don't over mm -hmm. rely mm -hmm. on technology. So how do you think <coughs> about finding that right balance and, and especially when there are pressures pushing you, financial pressures pushing you in mm -hmm. one direction? Yeah, so I think one area that, that uh, we need to be thinking about is how we lean the force out. So we're always, <clears throat> our, our force is defined first by our responsibilities. And so we have responsibilities internationally and we have responsibilities at home and, and those are unique and frankly people-centric in, in many respects uh, to you know, aiding uh, our citizens at home. That's not something you do uh, from afar. You have to do that up close and personal. And quite frankly, as populations grow and uh, these trends in urbanization continue, uh, the importance of uh, very switched on, highly capable, adaptive, agile leaders is going to be more important, not less. Uh, so that's our first point, is we're going to continue to focus on our people. Uh, but having said that, as I mentioned before, we're, our personnel count's going to go down. Um, and, but even as it does, we're still going to spend about you know, a little bit less than half of our budget on people. So as we get smaller, we have to get more out of those people. And so the first part of uh, answering your question is, how do we optimize our people? And so uh, giving them very dynamic training environments that uh, confront them with a variety of different challenges so that they maintain an, uh, uh, an intellectual and operational agility and not get uh, kind of uh, used to doing one thing is very important to that. Uh, keeping them involved in the international environment as we uh, have done uh, with regionally aligned forces in Africa, uh, as we continue to do with the forces that are, of course, stationed in Europe and stationed in the Pacific, <clears throat> and in, with the forces that we rotate down into Latin America, as an example. Uh, those are all ways to keep uh, our soldiers and our, our leaders uh, engaged in the world and, uh, and, and aware of what's going on, and frankly, acculturated, not necessarily culturally expert or uh, linguistically expert, but understand how to operate and, and uh, uh, interact with other cultures and people uh, so that we can uh, build partners, uh, build their capacity, and, uh, you know, when necessary, operate with them more effectively. But at the same time, as we look farther into the future, we have to think about leveraging some of the uh, emerging opportunities. Uh, you know, brain science is, uh, is, is an emerging area uh, uh, in understanding how to leverage that science to improve the performance of our people is, I think, going to be uh, a key area of investment going forward. You know, interestingly, uh, the brains, of, uh, brain waves of a master versus someone who's an amateur, the brain wave of Tiger Woods when he's driving off of a tee is very low, and whereas the amateur's brain is firing all over the place because he has not mastered the skill. What that means is that Tiger Woods is able to devote all of his cognitive energy to solving a problem, looking at the wind, making sure the ball goes where he wants to, et cetera, while the amateur is just worried about getting the ball off the tee. And so if we can leverage that, that emerging understanding and uh, help our younger leaders in particular uh, master tasks more effectively so that they become intuitive, they'll be more capable of devoting all their energy to solving problems and be more effective and they'll have uh, greater judgment uh, and therefore be able to do more at the lowest possible level. So getting the people better is a key part of that. We are, uh, again, as I think you know, uh, committed to digitizing the Army. Uh, I think we've made uh, some great strides in that area and getting the Army into an, you know, an information space where you're not <clears throat> uh, worried about or concerned about where your buddies are because you, you can see that and you know inherently where they're at, where you're getting more information that's actionable at the lowest possible levels will empower those leaders that are uh, enabled. 
And then if we are able to couple those two, two things with uh, you know, some of the virtual reality capabilities that are coming forward or augmented reality in operations, uh, they're going to perform at a much higher level because they will have seen and experienced a lot of this stuff virtually, and that will raise their performance uh, in ways that I think we don't quite understand yet. Uh, and that will allow them <clears throat> to make decisions at very low levels and to employ capabilities at very low levels that we currently reserve at echelons you know, far above them. I mean, when I, my last assignment in Afghanistan, I was often uh, called in to approve targeting uh, for people at several echelons below me. Well, that's because they didn't have the experience and judgment, uh, or at least the Army felt that way. And uh, so Brigadier General Hicks had to, to make that call, not a captain major, or indeed, even in many cases, a colonel. And so that's, I think, a, a key area of getting more out of the people we have. Another part is to make sure we understand what is operationally, uh, uh, what does the operational side of the Army look like? You know, we have this current kind of uh, taxonomy of tooth and tail. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to rethink that. <clears throat> uh, clearly, uh, our cyber warriors are not tail. They have an effect either on the environment we operate in or on the people uh, that we're operating with or against. Uh, and we need to count them as part of the tooth. So that tooth-tail ratio may be a thing of the past. But what we do need to do is understand what parts of the Army have that effect on the environment or on the people that we're uh, aimed at influencing, <clears throat> either uh, to help them or in some cases to compel them to do our will. Uh, and then what part of the Army is there to and actually has an effect on that operational force, in other words, enables them to operate and then focus on how do we achieve the right balance and then reduce the number of people in that support structure so that the investment of a smaller army in terms of manpower actually gives you the same or more capability going forward. And there are some you know, promising uh, areas uh, there in terms of uh, fuel efficiency, greater reliability of platforms, which therefore demand less uh, uh, support. <clears throat> uh, there's also the potential in some cases that we can augment uh, forces. And so I was talking with one of your colleagues beforehand, you know, I don't think this is right around the corner. Some people will represent it that way. But uh, unmanned and manned teaming on the ground where uh, units have greater effect uh, is something where we think uh, the potential maybe in 10 or 15 years to really begin to see a shift in capability and make uh, fighting formations more lethal and agile without adding additional manpower will be important. Uh, we've already begun doing that in the air. Uh, we have uh, actually, we've done it in Afghanistan uh, in, in live operations. But the air uh, domain is a far less complex environment than land and right now the robots on land require a great deal of supervision if you want to get something out of them. They tend to turn over or drive the wrong way or uh, any number of other things if you don't keep an eye on them today. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if some of the uh, learning systems and artificial intelligence actually delivers, uh, there may be an opportunity to have them uh, operate, uh, you know, kind of in a relationship that you see with a hunter and a bird dog, where they're, you know, the bird dog augments the, the hunter, and there, there's a learned behavior between the two. That's uh, something, if we were able to do that, would be very powerful. Um, on the other end, looking at the support structures, uh, there are a number of uh, more near-term things. Uh, that I think will allow us to begin uh, reducing that end of the uh, force without uh, impacting capability. Uh, one promising area, uh, and I'll say this, uh, we have a, a uh, robotic truck capability uh, that you can apply to almost any truck in our inventory that performs at a higher level than the Google car that everybody sees on TV. And uh, we've demonstrated that here recently several different times, and I think that's a, a, an area of great potential. Now, you may not be able to use that far forward where, you know, you need people to be thinking about the enemy, <laughs> but in the, uh, you know, farther away from where contact may be, uh, if you don't have to have 10 trucks with uh, 20 soldiers, you know, two per truck driving them, that's a, that's a great opportunity. So it's Things like that, I think, will probably over the next five to ten years, you'll start seeing uh, some improvement there. So 
being able to rebalance that relationship between the operational force and the support force will allow us to be smarter about uh, getting more out of a smaller manpower pool.